This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we'll meet the man who bankrupted Mark Twain. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Typesetters in Gutenberg's time had to pick up and set one letter at a time. And that's how type was still set just a hundred years ago. Between 1822 and 1884, inventors struggled to mechanize this slow process. Otmar Mergenthaler finally succeeded with his linotype machine in 1884. After that, linotype operators set type five times as fast as a human typesetter could. But historian Judith Lee tells us about another inventor, James Page. Page patented his own typesetting machine, the Page Compositor, 12 years earlier. Then he joined with the Farnham Company in 1877. The Farnham Company went to its best-known investor, Mark Twain, for support. Twain was intrigued by Page's machine and began to put money in it. By 1882, Page had built a functioning compositor. Page made two subtle but serious mistakes in designing his machine. The first was a compulsion to keep improving it. He wasn't ready to patent the production version until 1887. By then, linotype machines had been on the market for three years. But Page was certain he had the better machine. His compositor could set type 60% faster than the linotype. How could he lose? Mark Twain had long since become a true believer in the compositor. By now, he'd assumed a major financial responsibility for it in exchange for a percentage of the anticipated profits. Then Page's second mistake surfaced. The compositor was a temperamental racehorse. The linotype was a steady workhorse. Page had designed his machine to function like a human being. He'd consciously copied human hand motions. But Mergenthaler had made his linotype without reference to human function. He understood that machines can move in ways that humans can't, so his linotype was simpler, cheaper, easier to maintain, and less liable to break down. Machine tolerances weren't as tight. Furthermore, with 18,000 parts, Page's compositor was far more complicated. It ultimately priced itself right out of the market. It took until 1894 for the competitive failure of the compositor to become complete. After that, Page died penniless in a poorhouse, and Mark Twain went bankrupt. Twain later observed that he'd learned two things from the experience. One was not to invest when you can't afford to, and the other was not to invest when you can. The one surviving compositor is housed in the Mark Twain Memorial in Hartford, Connecticut. It's a beautiful machine. But we better understand today that good designs have to do more than just carry out their function. Good designs have to be robust, simple, maintainable, and easy to manufacture. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we'll look at tunnels from an odd angle. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. So much of our technology seems to express basic human urges. We want to fly through the air, to communicate with each other, to travel about freely, and I remember as a small boy wanting to tunnel, to hollow my own house out of a snowbank, to dig my own cave in the backyard, to explore the huge sandstone caves along the Mississippi. And sure enough, we find that tunneling has drawn one great engineer after another into startling excesses of construction. The ancients were greater tunnelers than most of us realize, and I don't just mean catacombs and crypts. In 525, the Greeks cut a six-foot square water supply tunnel two-thirds of a mile long on the island of Samos. The Romans connected two towns with a mile-long, 30-foot-wide Posilipo road tunnel in 36 BC. But the really great civil engineers of the 19th century were drawn into really grand tunneling. Two new kinds of transport created a need for tunnels. 
Railways had to lie on almost flat ground, and so did England's huge canal system, which had become its primary commercial trade route. Canals and railways, like the Roman aqueducts before them, spawned some heroic tunneling through obstacles. Typical of these was Mark Brunel's rail tunnel under the Thames, the first attempt to work in the really soft soil under a river. It was begun in 1825 and opened to foot traffic in 1843. During these 18 years, Brunel invented the whole technology of soft soil tunneling. He also suffered cave-ins, deaths, personal injury, and in the end he bankrupted his company. The tunnel wasn't open to trains until 1865, 40 years after it was begun, but it's still in use today. The star-crossed Hussack Tunnel through a mountain in western Massachusetts was started as a canal tunnel in 1851 and completed as a rail tunnel in 1876. It was 26 feet square and 5 miles long. It consumed 199 lives, and it almost bankrupted Massachusetts. But the effort also provided all kinds of new tunneling technology, including the now common pneumatic drill. Today those technologies are highly refined, and some remarkable tunneling goes on without much fanfare. Who's heard of the 85-mile-long Delaware Aqueduct Tunnel that carries water from the Catskills to New York City? It was finished in 1942. Tunnels have evoked some amazing engineering, but I was a child in cold Minnesota, and my favorite tunnel is the one in John Greenleaf Whittier's Snowbound. To get from the farmhouse to the barn, he says, we cut the solid whiteness through, and where the drift was deepest made, a tunnel walled and overlaid with dazzling crystal. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's ask what meters really measure. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. When Shakespeare said, man is the measure of all things, he was closer to literal truth than we realize. The gauges and meters we use to measure things usually begin by copying our own senses. You can see that by looking at our weights and measures which largely reflect what we see and feel. For example, a pound or even a kilogram is roughly the mass of any fairly dense material, like a rock or a piece of metal, that we can hold comfortably in our hand. The inch, foot, yard, and meter all correspond roughly with various body parts. The mile and kilometer also have a meaning that's made clear in parts of rural America where people talk about the distance of a sea. Ask someone in eastern Kentucky how far it is into town and he might say, oh, about two seas. He means you should look down the road as far as you can see. Where your vision runs out, you spot, say, an oak tree. You walk to it and look again. There in the distance is the town just two seas away. And how far is a sea? Of course it varies, but even in flat terrain, our ability to make things out usually ends after about a mile or a kilometer. We divide our thermometers into degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius, and these are roughly the smallest increments of temperature we can feel. We usually know if we have a one degree fever. We can sense about one volt with our tongue. Our ears are sensitive to about one pound per square inch of pressure change, and so on. The kilowatt and horsepower are roughly the power that most of us can produce in a short sprint, like running upstairs. By the way, when James Watt specified the unit of a horsepower, he made it less than the work of a real horse, so his engines would seem more powerful. Not only is the kilowatt or horsepower close to the maximum power you or I can produce, it's also the most power we can tangle with without being hurt. The rate the sun pours energy on us when we tan ourselves on the beach, or the rate we consume energy when we take a hot shower. Since we're the basis for most of our measuring devices, our science reflects the world in human terms. But that's not really so bad. Scientists realize that science isn't ultimate truth. It's something we construct to make our experiences predictable. Our science-based engineering obviously serves us by mirroring human needs and nature. 
and so does science itself. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we go back 2,200 years to North Africa. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Alexander the Great fell ill and died in 323 BC after 12 years of conquest, but not ordinary conquest. He'd worked very hard at mixing the cultures of East and West, at stimulating trade, cultural exchange, and intermarriage. His empire fell apart after his death, but the effects of the mixing remained. He'd founded some 15 cities named Alexandria, but the one just west of Cairo emerged as the center of Mediterranean culture. A new dialect of Greek, called the Koinia, became the common language of the eastern Mediterranean basin. And Alexandria drew talent like a magnet. Euclid, Archimedes, and the astronomer Ptolemy all worked there. Alexandria remained the intellectual center of the world for three centuries, until Rome took it over after the death of Cleopatra in 30 BC. The much-praised technology of the Romans was built on the inventions of the great Alexandrian engineers. Plumbing, gearing, and water wheels, for example, all came from Alexandria. These engineers were less famous than Euclid and Archimedes. They had names like Tzibios, Heron, Vitruvius, and Philon. The most remarkable Alexandrian invention was feedback control. A feedback device automatically corrects the way a machine functions. Present-day feedback devices include thermostats, speed controllers, and pressure regulators. The Alexandrian engineers invented all sorts of float valves and other liquid level regulators. The most important machine that used these gadgets was the water clock. The Alexandrian water clock was the basic timekeeper for about 1,500 years until the mechanical clock replaced it in the 14th century. Alexandria was freewheeling, open, polycultural, and wonderfully inventive. After the authoritarian Romans took it over, invention dried up in Alexandria. It's interesting that the development of feedback also stopped dead cold in its tracks and didn't resurface until a new craving for freedom swept Europe in the middle 18th century. But that's another story. Alexandria re-emphasizes a familiar message, one that good educators understand. The people who really invent things are people who expose themselves to a lot of different influences and can let their minds run free. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we learn how telegraphy came to India. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. In 1854, the British in India completed an 800-mile telegraph line between Calcutta and Agra. This system was the brainchild of a visionary inventor named William O'Shaughnessy, and it did much to secure England's grip on India. O'Shaughnessy had gone to India 21 years earlier, in 1833, as an assistant surgeon with the East India Company. There he began to experiment with electricity. He invented an electric motor and a silver chloride battery. Then, in 1839, he set up a 13 and a half mile long demonstration telegraph system near Calcutta. That was just two years after Samuel F. B. Morse built his demonstration system in the United States. But O'Shaughnessy wasn't aware of Morse's work. His telegraph used a different code, and the message was transmitted by imposing a series of very small electric shocks on the operator. He also came up with another unique invention. He used a two and a half mile stretch of the Hulyi River in place of wire to complete the circuit. Historian Mel Gorman tells us that it took 
11 years for O'Shaughnessy to gain support to put in a regular system. By 1851, he had a 27-mile line in service near Calcutta, and the first Trans-India line was running three years later. O'Shaughnessy's construction of the India telegraph system was an amazing triumph over technical and bureaucratic problems. By now, he knew about the new English and American telegraph systems, and he had to invent his own equipment to avoid patents, to reduce costs, and to accommodate local problems. He invented his own signal transmitter, his own methods for stringing lines, and so forth. It was a good system, and in 1854 it helped the British in the Crimean War. Three years later it was decisive in putting down the Sepoy Mutiny. A captured mutineer being led to the gallows pointed to a telegraph line and bravely cried, There is the accursed string that strangles us. One may question 19th century British colonialism, but we can only admire O'Shaughnessy. He shows us what one person can do when he really trusts his own creative ability and then looks squarely at a real problem. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we name a new machine. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. A.J. Meadows claims that the way we name our machines depends on their maturity, that we don't settle in on a name until the machine has settled itself into our lives. Try the airplane. A hundred years ago, there were dozens of terms like aerial velocipede, aerial screw machine, aerodrome, aeromotive engine, and bird machine, and, of course, flying machine. Most of these names vanished ten years after the Wright brothers flew, and sure enough, we've settled now on just two names, airplane and aircraft. No one I knew had a refrigerator when I was little. We had an ice box with a rack on top where we put a new 50-pound block of ice every few days. I still forget and annoy my son by calling our refrigerator an ice box. During the 30s, we tried all kinds of terms for the then new machine, Frigidaire, electric ice box, and of course, refrigerator. The two words engine and machine show up again and again when the devices are first named. They come from Latin and Greek roots and broadly refer to devices that carry out functions. So the steam engine was first called a fire engine, and it still keeps the engine part. We still talk about sewing machines, but no one calls a telescope an optical engine anymore the way they did in the 17th century. I especially like the name Babbage gave his first computer 150 years ago. He called it an analytical engine. By the way, there's presently a software package for checking programs called a parsing engine. Foreign names stick to new gadgets for a while, but then they tend to fade. American designers have moved away from the French words empennage, fuselage, and nacelle in favor of the English equivalents tail, body, and pod. The German name zeppelin has gradually given away to dirigible. Today, we only call a writing desk an escritoire to run its price up. The first names we give to new technologies often tie them to older ones. So an early name for the first dirigibles was aerial locomotives, and railway passengers still ride in coaches. Finally, play a game with me. Watch during the next few years as we change the names related to computers. Watch as we run through words like screen, CRT, and monitor. Watch as we select among names like mini-computer, PC, word processor, or simply the machine. Watch as we try to settle on terminology for this particular engine of our ingenuity. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we pass by one of the greatest men of our century. 
The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. It was 1954. I was an army private at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. I was free this particular hot summer's day, so I walked to the highway and put out my thumb. In my writing case was a thermodynamics text. I wanted to find a quiet place to write letters and to study Einstein's theory of specific heats. The first car that stopped was going to Princeton. That seemed as good a destination as any. Isn't that where Einstein lives, I asked, and the man allowed that it was. I got out at the university, asked where Einstein was, and was told that he worked two miles outside of town at the Institute for Advanced Studies. So I walked to the Institute and sat for an hour in its large commons room, studying thermodynamics and watching very smart people coming and going. But no Einstein. I gave up my ad hoc pilgrimage and started back to town. Where the road turned, I looked over my shoulder and saw a figure two blocks back. The sun behind him cast a brilliant halo through a mop of frizzy white hair. It was he. I stalled watching a golf game while he passed and strode on into town. I fell in behind him. He walked vigorously, greeting friends and neighbors. Then he stopped and laid his briefcase on a hedge. I was terrified. Did he know I was following him? No. He was just removing his heavy blue sweater. As I passed him, I saw suspenders over a T-shirt holding baggy trousers. He wore sandals and no socks. That much fit the stereotype. What didn't was his substance. He was then 75 years old with less than a year left to live. But he had an earthy muscularity. He had physical grace, strength, and coordination. How many people today know that he was a good violinist? Einstein was more than just airy energy and light. He had mass and physical presence as well. That now battered thermodynamics text sits on my shelf without Einstein's autograph in it. I was far too shy, unformed, and uncertain to speak to him. And the other famous names from my youth, Roosevelt, Chiang Kai-shek, Churchill, fade against the light, energy, and mass of this simple man standing by a hedge, juggling stars and forces and fields in his head. This man who made us understand that the world is more than it seemed to be. This good-humored man who insisted that God is subtle, but he is not malicious. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's talk about ceremony and technology. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Grandma used to tell me that if I burned my finger, I should dip it in a cup of tea. She knew that long before doctors knew anything about the healing power of the tannic acid in tea. Now, my grandmother was a fine, intelligent woman, but she didn't know organic chemistry. The art of Japanese samurai sword making is like that. It reached an astonishing level of perfection as early as 800 A.D., 1,200 years ago. A samurai sword is a wonderfully delicate and complex piece of engineering. The steel of the blade is heated and folded and beaten over and over again until the blades formed by 33,000 layers forge welded to one another. Each layer is a hundred thousandth of an inch thick. All this is done to extremely accurate standards of heat treatment. The result's an obsidian hard blade with willow-like flexibility. These blades represent a perfection of production standards that modern quality control hasn't matched. Yet the Japanese craftsmen who made them didn't know anything about temperature measurement or the carbon content of steel. How do you suppose they repeated such perfection? The answer is one we'd be well advised to remember. Sword making was swathed in ceremony and ritual. It was consistent because the ceremony was precise and unvaried. The ceremony was beautiful in action, dress, and color. Heat-treating temperatures were controlled by holding the blade to the color of the morning sun. 
The exact hue was transmitted from master to apprentice down through the centuries. Sword making was part of Japanese art, and it was subsumed into Japanese culture. That sort of thing wasn't unique to the Japanese. It was true of 18th century violin making and 12th century cathedral building. Ritual did what was later done with weights and measures. Our intelligence, after all, runs deeper than a mere ability to read gauges. Our great technologies arise out of a full range of experience. They come from creativity that's triggered by more than tables of technical data. Good technology isn't independent of culture. The best doctors know organic chemistry and their grandmother's folklore. The best metallurgist knows about iron carbon phase diagrams and medieval Japanese craftsmanship. The best engineers know mathematics, physics, and thermodynamics, but they also know the world they live in. The best engineers have a deep-seated knowledge of the people they serve. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we'll try to cross the English Channel. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. For thousands of years, the English Channel has been a barrier that's tantalized people. It's a neck of cold, forbidding waters as little as 21 miles wide, separating Europe from England. We hear Shakespeare saying to Henry V's army, And thence to France shall we convey you safe and bring you back, charming the narrow sea to give you gentle pass. But when Hitler stared across the Channel in 1941, he found those 21 miles too far to go. So it's not surprising that people have looked at many means for getting themselves across. The first time the channel yielded to anything other than a boat was over 200 years ago. That was Blanchard's balloon crossing in 1785, a little over a year after the first balloon ascent was made in Paris. The most primitive means for crossing the channel, of course, is swimming. And it's odd that we have no records of anyone trying that before 1872, a century after it was flown. The first person to succeed was Matthew Webb, who swam it three years later in 1875. It took him 22 hours. Like ballooning, heavier-than-air flight was attracted to the channel almost immediately. In 1908, the London Daily Mail offered a hundred-pound prize for the first channel flight. That was only five years after the Wright brothers and only two years after the first European flight. The Frenchman, Louis Blériot, won the prize a year later. And, in 1979, a strange 75-pound airplane called the Gossamer Albatross won the 100,000-pound Kremer Prize for the first human-powered flight across the channel. For three hours, pilot Brian Allen pedaled its propeller and flew it into the record books. All this makes us wonder, what next? Well, I'll tell you what's next. Tunneling has already started under the channel. Two main tunnels with a smaller access tunnel between them, are being drilled through the chalk marl under the channel. This joint English-French project will cost $10 billion. Tunnels reaching out from both Folkestone and Calais are to be joined in the summer of 1990. The idea of tunneling isn't new. The English and French began one in 1881, but the British aborted it for fear it could serve the French as an invasion route. The British started another one 15 years ago, but had to abandon it for lack of money. I suppose the next project will be a bridge. Not that it strikes me as practical. It just seems like the kind of challenge engineers won't be able to resist indefinitely. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, Queen Victoria sends a telegram to President Buchanan. 
The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. After Samuel F. B. Morse showed that long-distance telegraphy was workable, we quickly wove a spider web of lines over America. One of the first was Morse's cable under New York Harbor. Taking telegraphy into the inky ocean depths opened a mare's nest of problems. Still, a cable was run under the English Channel by 1851, 14 years after Morse's first demonstration. Three years later, in 1854, an English engineer named Gisborne went to the young American financier, Cyrus Field, with plans to lay a cable from America to Newfoundland. Field went home to think it over and decided to go for broke. He set up a company to lay telegraph cable all the way to England. The line to Newfoundland was finished in two years. The waters were fairly shallow and the silt bottom protected the cable. But the 2,200-mile stretch under the Atlantic posed terrible difficulties. The first cables were stranded copper, insulated with gutta-percha and tarred hemp. They were wound with 300,000 miles of iron wire to protect them. They were about half an inch in diameter. No ship was big enough to carry 2,200 miles of cable, so it had to be spliced in mid-ocean. The cables broke twice and were lost, but a third try succeeded in 1858. And all the while, scientists and engineers argued about how much voltage it would take to carry a signal over the terrible distance. The high-voltage people won out with a 2,000-volt system. After a month of operation, it burned through the insulation off the coast of Ireland. While it lasted, the cable was met with euphoria. A 98-word message from Queen Victoria to President Buchanan took 17 hours to send on the failing cable. But New Yorkers celebrated the link-up with fireworks in the street. Then, the cable failure, followed by the Civil War, ended the project until 1865. But in 1865, another failure came to the rescue. The Great Eastern, the largest ship ever built, had failed as a passenger ship because it burned too much fuel. But it was big enough to carry a single strand of one-inch reinforced cable 2,700 miles long, a single strand that weighed 5,000 tons. The cable broke in 1865, but the Great Eastern succeeded a year later. A once-bitten public wasn't so excited this time, but now a stronger cable, operating under low voltage, survived to change the very character of commerce between America and Europe. It's hard to digest, but success in technology is almost always the offspring of failure. Things just don't work the first time, and success is usually hard-earned. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we look at a surprising claim about colonial technology. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Historian Alex Rowland suggests that colonial inventiveness was less than it's cracked up to be. He begins by directing our attention to Bushnell's invention of the submarine. Bushnell was one of our most famous colonial inventors. In 1776, he built a one-man, hand-crank-powered submarine called the Turtle. The Turtle swam under the British ship Eagle and fastened a charge to its copper-clad hull. When the charge exploded, it did little or no damage, but the potential of this new instrument of war was made clear enough. Still, Bushnell abandoned the Turtle a year later, and this time he went at British ships moored in Philadelphia with floating mines. Once more, he was more impressive than successful. Colonial composer Francis Hopkinson wrote about the reaction on the British-occupied shore. He said, Some fire cried, which some denied, but said the earth had quaked, and girls and boys with hideous noise ran through the streets half-naked. Bushnell has ever since been hailed as the father of the submarine and as a great American technological genius. 
Rowland points out that the colonies were very well informed about European technology. Bushnell, it seems, worked with the turtle at Yale University, and the Yale Library had the English Gentleman's Magazine, a kind of 18th century scientific American. I've looked at the 1747 volume of the Gentleman's Magazine, and sure enough, there's a short article with European sketches of how submarines might be built. They have many of the features of Bushnell's turtle. It's all too easy to start embroidering this theme. American successes with the steamboat, the electric light, the Erie Canal, the telegraph, they all followed European inventions of these technologies. Rowland argues that the United States didn't actually originate many new major technologies until the 20th century. And yet, we put flesh and blood on these skeletal ideas. Bushnell was the first to put a living, breathing man underwater in combat. The confident, go-and-do-it mentality of colonial and 19th century America displayed real inventiveness and a real component of genius. Do you see this drama being replayed today? Forty years ago, we sneered at Japan for making second-rate copies of our technologies. Today, we ask how on earth they develop our inventions so rapidly and so well. Tomorrow, if we don't rediscover our own childlike verve and enthusiasm for both invention and development, we'll be looking to Japan for seminal ideas. I'm John Leadhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's talk about skyscrapers. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Skyscraper is a nice word. When I was a child, the 41-story First National Bank building loomed larger than anything else in St. Paul, Minnesota, and it did indeed seem to scrape the very sky. The modern skyscraper came into its own in the early 1890s, but so much new technology had to be combined before it made sense to raise buildings beyond about five stories. Before architects could take that bold step into the sky, someone had to develop a workable elevator. Someone else had to see that the shell of the building should be hung on a steel skeleton. It wasn't enough to hang iron facades on wood or brick frames. A whole new technology of building foundations had to be invented, and people had to learn to design against wind loads that were becoming enormous. Architect Tom Peters thinks that the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 did a lot to give these lovely monsters their present shape and form. Before the fire, Chicago's architecture was uninhibited and undisciplined. The 18,000 buildings that perished were made of wood and brick with some iron facing. The commerce that had built Chicago was hardly touched by the fire, and those interests exerted great pressure to rebuild a fireproof city, an iron city, and to make the best use of crowded downtown real estate. So two factions converged on the rubble, the freewheeling builders of old Chicago and a new breed of formal designers trained in analytical mechanics. They didn't agree, but out of their conflict emerged bold new concepts for making tall, steel-framed buildings, concepts that had to be grounded on complex engineering analysis. These new buildings couldn't rise any higher than an elevator could carry its occupants. Hydraulic lifts had been around since the 1830s, but they couldn't go to great heights. And Elisha Otis invented a safe steam-powered elevator in 1857. Of course, it had to have someone stoking a fire under the boiler. But electric motors finally got around these problems. The first electric elevators were tried out in Germany in 1880, and practical control systems made them effective in the early 1890s. By the turn of the centuries, the tall buildings were typically 15 stories high. Thirty years later, the Empire State Building was seven times that. And a great impetus for all this was Mrs. O'Leary's fictional cow who kicked over her fictional lantern and burned down a very real Chicago. What followed was a remarkable convergence of new technologies that altered American life. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work.
This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we watch Joseph Stalin set aircraft distance records. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. If I learn one thing from history, it's that technology is effective when it flows from some internal wellspring of the technologists themselves. When kings and emperors interfere with this process, they only damage it in the long run. Joseph Stalin, for example, completed his takeover of Russia in 1929, and he began ruthless collectivization and murderous purges. Then, in 1933, he started a campaign to build up Russian morale to draw attention away from his ongoing slaughter of so-called enemies of the people. He flung Russian airplane designers and pilots into the competition for flight records. This way, the Russian papers were able to boast of technical success after success while Soviet citizens were being trucked off to the gulags. In 1933, Stalin seized on the work of the famous Russian designer Tupolev, who was already developing a long-distance airplane. But Russia's first sally into the records war was made in January 1934 when three Russian balloonists bested an American altitude record and, as it happened, died in doing so. By 1938, Russia had claimed some 68 records for distance, altitude, and various firsts. One of the more spectacular ones was a 6,300-mile polar flight from Moscow to San Jacinto, California in 1937. Before each flight, Stalin met the pilots, discussed their plans, and publicly worried about their safety. He met returning airplanes while flashbulbs popped. All the while, the death toll in Russian pilots rose. Then two things happened. One was that Russia's lead started to slip. In 1939, for example, a plane left Moscow to set a record flying to New York. It was to arrive in time for the opening of the New York World's Fair, but it crashed in New Brunswick. The pilots arrived in New York, but did so in an American rescue plane. But Russia's greater failure came in the Spanish Civil War, that ghastly proving ground for fascist and Bolshevik ordinance before World War II. By 1937, it had become clear that Russian airplanes, which had been designed to win distance and altitude records, were no match for German combat planes. Stalin reacted by jailing Tupolev and nearly 500 of his aeronautical engineers. Russian aviation had done brilliantly in the short term, but when all was said and done, it never did recover from the long-term damage that Stalin had done it. We see here what we've seen before in this series, but never in quite such gross and simple terms, that engineers best serve the general health of society when they chase their own dreams. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's see what happens when two or more technologies join forces. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. I want you to try a little experiment the next time you have a moment. First, find three metal masses, nuts, bolts, lead sinkers, whatever's handy. Now hang one on the end of a thread and swing it. The motion is simple, a little pendulum that moves back and forth in just one way. Next, take a longer length of thread and attach all three masses along its length. Space them out about two feet apart. Then hang this string of masses from the ceiling. Start this system swinging and watch what happens. No matter how they start out, they're soon moving in the most unexpected ways. The middle one might momentarily stop dead while the other two gyrate around it. They might all move in the same plane or they might swing in circles. And the patterns of movement keep changing. Going from one mass to a system of three masses takes us from a motion that we can easily understand to one that mystifies us. Our technological systems are like that. In October 1987, we saw what happened when a computer-controlled stock market responded to a ripple in the economy. 
We'd told our computers how to respond to certain changes, but we weren't at all prepared for their aggregate response. We were stunned to see them flock together into the greatest one-day stock market crash the world had ever seen. That same sort of thing was true of the Three Mile Island and Chernobyl reactor failures. So many elements were interconnected that an operator couldn't diagnose a change quickly enough to make the right corrective action. And yet, complex systems of technology are at the heart of the machinery of today's society. A friend of mine, an engineering designer, recently came back from Europe. John, he said, I had a remarkable experience. I had to call home, so I picked up the phone in my hotel, pushed a few buttons, and found myself talking to America. I looked at him and said, so what? He said, stop and think. How many terribly complex systems had to be put together to give me that convenience? The space technology to put up a satellite, the electronic technologies on the ground, the radio technologies in the sky, the hotel management systems, and so on and on. So I did stop and think. Today's engineers have to worry as much about combining technologies effectively as they have to worry about inventing them. Ill-conceived systems threaten us with terrible mischief. Well-combined technologies stand to present us with amazing benefits and conveniences. And the intellectual challenges of complex systems design are dazzling. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we meet Rudolf Diesel. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. No other engine inventor's name is as closely tied to his engine as Rudolf Diesel's is. But Diesel worked hard to make it that way. Historian Linwood Bryant tells us that Diesel saw himself as a scientific genius and the James Watt of the late 19th century. He was vain, oversensitive, and not a little paranoid. He didn't win the hearts of other engine makers. In 1912, 20 years after the engine was conceived, four books were written about its development. Diesel wrote one. The other three were by people who were out to minimize his claims. The seeds of the dispute, Bryant argues, were sowed in Diesel's own view of invention, the usual view that a device is first invented, then developed, and finally improved. Diesel left very clear records of what he actually did. There's no doubt that between 1890 and 93 he invented the engine using his knowledge of thermodynamics. The idea of burning fuel slowly and at higher pressures was certainly his. There's also no doubt that he worked from 1893 to 97 at the Augsburg Machine Works to develop a working engine. During this time, Diesel faced problem after problem. To solve them, he had to do a lot more theoretical work and more invention. In Diesel's view, he was still inventing the engine. People outside the process saw all this as development, the dirty work that anyone has to go through to make a good idea into workable hardware. After 1897, Diesel figured he was done with his invention, and he turned to promoting it. But the engine was woefully unready for the market. Eleven more years of improvement and innovation were needed. Meanwhile, Diesel worked himself into a nervous breakdown, promoting the not-yet-ready engine. Now, the 1912 controversy becomes clearer. Diesel saw his own development as a continuation of the inventive process, and it was most surely that. But what went on from 1897 to 1908, the innovation that made the engine commercially feasible, that he viewed as no more than simple cleanup work by lesser minds. He irritated other engine designers by sneering at their work. He failed to see that what made his engine viable in the marketplace was a lot of truly inventive thinking by a lot of good engineers. Diesel was badly troubled by the criticism, and in 1913 he vanished from a boat to England. His body was found ten days later. His death brought out all kinds of lurid stories about plots to sell secrets to the British. But it's pretty clear that he only committed suicide. All Diesel's concern over public opinion was such an unhappy thing. 
a person with that kind of talent should have known how to sit back and enjoy it. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, a brief look back. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The time's come for me to ask what I've learned so far in The Engines of Our Ingenuity. What's this set of case histories of human inventiveness taught me? Writing these spots has helped me to see some things whole, some things I'd only understood in a fragmentary way before. The efforts changed the way I view my own work, and it's changed the way I see students in the classroom. First, let me explain that none of my examples have been chosen to make a point. I've looked for material that seemed interesting, and then let it lead where it would. The poet, Wallace Stevens, said, To impose is not to discover. He meant, of course, that the world is ready to teach us many things, if we just shut up and listen. And that's what I've tried to do. Yet certain things have come through again and again. One is that freedom and invention are natural bedfellows. When we try to dictate where a technology should go, we simply kill the goose to get the golden eggs. The best inventor also follows Stephen's advice and lets one good idea lead to another, lets the natural beauty, order, and simplicity of things come through. Next, we've seen that success rises out of failure. Successful inventors calmly learn the lessons that failures teach them. The winner is also the person who isn't distracted by worries about fame and fortune. Many of the saddest people we've met made wonderful contributions but brooded over a lack of public acclaim. The happiest ones found their pleasure in the creative act itself. Their reward was the beauty they'd brought into the world. Edison, for example, was quite a businessman, but he always recentered himself on the existential pleasure of making things. Another thing we've seen is that developing an idea can be as creative and adventurous as coming up with the idea in the first place. In fact, it's often hard to locate the stage where we should say that invention has been completed. But we've consistently seen that at any stage, to invent, we have to perceive some simple thing in a way that other people haven't yet seen it. And finally, we've seen that simplicity is at the heart of the whole business. Einstein, after all, was a person who wouldn't clutter his life by using two different soaps, one for washing and one for shaving. And that, finally, is what I want to be able to show students in my classroom, that understanding a thing means seeing the essential simplicity that lies at the heart of it. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we really are interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we see how long an airplane can stay up. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Records are funny things. Take the speed of flight. In 1880, the first primitive airships went about seven miles an hour. World War I airplanes reached 130 miles an hour, and in 1944, German combat jets flew almost 600 miles an hour, just this side of the sound barrier. We'd been doubling air speeds every nine years, and now we kept right on going. By 1967, the North American X-15A reached more than 4,000 miles an hour. But then a strange thing happened. We'd launched our first satellite in 1958, and we put a live person in one in 1961. Suddenly, people were flying 18,000 miles an hour. When we got clear of the Earth's atmosphere, we could go almost any speed we wanted. Suddenly, no one gave a fig about speed records anymore. The big problem was now launching and landing. So the search for high speeds isn't fun anymore. 
we have to look for some other sort of record. Let's try the duration of terrestrial flight. In 1903, the Wright brothers stayed up for 12 seconds. Five years later, they were the first to stay aloft for more than an hour. In 1914, a German plane stayed up for over 24 hours, and Lindbergh took 33 hours for his transatlantic flight in 1927. Of course, the real drive was for long distances, not just staying up a long time. And the goal that got away from us for years was a non-stop, round-the-world flight with no refueling. That's something we didn't manage until very recently. Dick Rutan and Gina Yeager finally flew their experimental airplane, the Voyager, around the world, setting both distance and endurance records. They stayed in the air for an incredible nine days. But now, the Canadian government is developing a microwave-powered airplane. It's powered by microwave beams from stations on the Earth. This plane could simply stay up forever. Its inventor, Joe Schlesak, says modestly, the Wright brothers' first flight was 12 seconds. I think we'll do much better than that. Records really are funny things. We can only chase them until we get better than the game we're playing. In all fairness, most of these record games really do seem to serve society. So we play each one for a while, outgrow it, and then go off to play some new game. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's try to design an airplane. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. As the clouds of World War II gathered in 1941, our Air Force badly needed better planes, and lots of them. So the Air Force went to automobile manufacturers for help. In 1941, General Motors started making B-29 parts, and Ford sent up a plant to make B-24s at Willow Run. Then General Motors hired Don Berlin, the man who designed the P-40. That was the fighter plane the Flying Tigers had been using in China. Up to then, airplanes had been almost handmade. Historian I.B. Holly tells us that the biggest airplane company could turn out three planes a day, while automobile makers made three cars a minute. Henry Ford, for one, didn't appreciate how hard it was to adapt a good airplane design to his mass production methods. He rashly claimed that, freed of government red tape, he'd be able to make more than a thousand planes a day. So, Don Berlin went to the Air Force with a plan that would link his skills as an airplane designer with General Motors' style of mass production. He showed them a new fighter plane design. The plane, the XP-75, was supposed to outperform our experimental fighters, but he was going to avoid the problems these planes were giving us. His plan was simple. He'd use the best parts of other airplanes the wing of the P-40, the tail of the A-24, the landing gear of the P-47, and so on. Like Pygmalion or Frankenstein, the XP-75 was to be an assembly of perfect parts. Unfortunately, the result resembled Frankenstein in more ways than one. It was an oversized monster that couldn't compete with the planes designed from the ground up. Yet in its haste, the Air Force had gone ahead and tooled up to mass-produce this beast. They were so sure it would succeed. When the whole thing was finally scrapped in 1944, it had cost over $9 million. That was still a huge chunk of the government budget back in 1944. A designer must, after all, seek out the harmony of the many parts that make up a design. He must see the design whole. Sophia Lauren once pointed out that all her parts were wrong. Her nose was the wrong shape, her mouth was too wide, and so on. Yet, who could fault her beauty? In a good design, the components have to make sense in the context of the whole. Just as a Miss America contest, with its focus on components, never identifies really great beauty, the XP-75 was no more than a collection of fine parts. It wasn't a whole airplane. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work.
This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we look at the question of size. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. We understand things on the scale that we experience them. We're often surprised by how differently things behave when they're very large or very small. To see what I mean, try this experiment. First find a very large and a very small metal sphere, say a BB and the large steel ball used in the shot put. Now drop each of them from a height of a few feet into a swimming pool. You'll see that the shot splash isn't at all like the scaled up BB splash. The large shot sends out a sheet of water that breaks into a fine spray of drops. There are only a few drops in the BB splash. That's the way we can tell if the naval battle in the movies is a scale model or a real battle. The splashes never look right in the scale model. I once knew a badly crippled construction worker. He'd been working on the ledge of a building that was being demolished when he saw a two-ton scoop swinging toward him, very gently, very slowly. He put out his hands to stop it as he might have stopped a child on a swing, and when it reached him, it very gently crushed him. His experience with playground swings had grievously misled him about the behavior of two-ton scoops. Engineers think a lot about making scale models of big prototypes. We wouldn't get very far if we had to make full-size wind tunnel tests of a Concorde SST. The trick is to set the conditions in a small model so its behavior is similar to the large prototype. For example, we really could use a BB experiment to learn about the large shot hitting water if we changed two things. The BB would have to move much faster than the shot, and we'd have to put just the right amount of detergent in the water to cut its surface tension. What the theory of modeling does is to tell us how to stretch the dimensions of all the variables, masses, speeds, material properties, into universal values. When we do this, funny things happen. For example, we can learn about the movement of microorganisms in our body fluids by making laboratory experiments with large objects moving very slowly through cold honey. The problem of modeling is one part of a general problem we have to face whenever we design things. We have to find ways to see what's not obvious to our eyes. We have to find ways to predict complicated behavior before it becomes part of our experience. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's look at steam engines in 18th century England. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Steam engines were England's gift to the world in the 18th century. Thomas Savory began it all with his steam pump in 1698. He was followed by Thomas Newcomen's first real steam engine in 1711. When James Watt sold his first engine in 1769, steam engines had been around for 70 years. Almost 600 of them had been built. What Watt did was to make improvements that left steam engines four times more efficient. His first engines only put out about six horsepower, not much more than the first Newcomen engines but they were smaller and they ate far less coal. And in less than 20 years, he'd increased the output to as much as 190 horsepower. In those days, 190 horsepower would by no means fit under the hood of a car. Those early engines were enormous. The cylinders of the old Newcomen engines were from 2 to 10 feet in diameter. A Newcomen engine was a two-story structure. Watt's engines were more compact, but their cylinders were still between one and a half and five feet in diameter. Historians Konevsky and Roby tell us that, as good as they were, Watt's engines didn't dominate production. 
By the end of the century, over 2,000 steam engines had been built in England, and fewer than 500 of them were watt engines. Actually, steam engines never did become the major power source during the 18th century. Most of the power still came from water wheels and windmills. Steam engine factories never did produce more than a few hundred total horsepower per year. But two things were happening. Steam power picked up those specialized tasks that were absolutely essential for the Industrial Revolution, like pumping water out of mines so we could have the coal and metals we needed. And steam power was the basis for the heavy power industries that so changed 19th century life. By 1800, the total power capacity of all the steam engines ever built was about the same as one of our larger diesel engines today. They didn't change the English countryside overnight, but they were the stalking horse of the greatest revolution the world had ever seen, the agents of changes that far outstripped anything their makers had ever thought of. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, some thoughts on fame and fortune. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. There's a hymn that's well known in England. It's based on a text from the apocryphal book of Ecclesiasticus. Let us now praise famous men, such as did bear rule in their kingdoms, men renowned for their power, such as found out musical tunes and recited verses in writing. All these were honored in their generations. Of course, we do honor famous people, but the text ends strangely. And some there be which have no memorial, who are perished as though they had never been. Their bodies are buried in peace, but their name lives forevermore. The people shall tell of their wisdom. You don't have to study the history of technology very long to be haunted by countless people with no memorial, who nevertheless do live forever, anonymous inventors of the wheel or the windmill or the plow. In that wonderful musical about Don Quixote, Man of La Mancha, the serving girl Aldonza asks Sancho Panza why Quixote does the things he does, why he glamorizes a dirty world. Why does he do these things, she sings, and Sancho cannot answer. We eventually ask that question about ourselves. Why do we undertake the quixotic task of making a nicer world? You find as many answers as engineers, of course. Some want fame, some want wealth, some really do want to leave a nicer world behind them. But so many simply take pleasure in the mental exercise of it all. So we create our own memorials. We achieve wealth by seeking wealth. We become famous by seeking fame. But look around at the memorials of anonymous technology that have made a nicer world. Leaps of the mind that made the automobile differential, the pencil sharpener, the electric plug, the microwave oven, the lawn sprinkler. I suppose we could find out who invented each of these things, but we aren't likely to. Yet, they're a finer memorial for the quixotic, mentally driven people who gave them to us than wealth or tombstones could ever be. The great engineering educator Llewellyn Belter used to say to new engineering students, the products of your minds are the most precious things that you own. You must do the right things with them. It's those products of your mind that live forever, even if they have no memorial. They're the most precious things that you own, and they're the most precious things that you have to give away. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, 
heads will roll on the engines of our ingenuity. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. We've praised technology enough on this program. The time has come to speak of darker things. Today, let's look at the guillotine. Beheading has an odd history. It's all mixed up in class distinctions. In ancient Greece, Xenophon singled it out as a noble punishment. The Romans, who did pretty horrible things to common criminals, also saved decapitation for nobler folk. They called it capitis amputatio. William the Conqueror brought beheading to England, where it was also set aside for the nobility, for people like Lady Jane Grey and Anne Boleyn. When the English beheaded the lower classes, it was only to finish off a victim who'd first been tormented in ways too nasty to talk about here. The only reason for mechanizing such a seldom-used punishment was that axemen were sometimes inaccurate. Victims, after all, paid executioners a gold coin so they'd cut cleanly. A few early beheading machines were tried out. The 16th century Scots used a device coyly named the Maiden, and an English machine called the Halifax Gibbet saw some use. But it took the egalitarian French Revolution to bring beheading to the common man. Joseph Guillotin was a physician and a member of the Constituent Assembly in the early days of the French Revolution. In 1789, he got a law passed requiring that beheading machines be made so that, and I quote, the privilege of decapitation would no longer be confined to nobles, and the process of execution would be as painless as possible. The machine was built, tested extensively on dead bodies, and turned loose on common criminals in 1792. Of course, once this was done, it became all too easy to dispose of counter-revolutionaries, and the slaughter called the Reign of Terror, followed. The American adventurer and inventor, Count Rumford, gave an interesting footnote to Guillotin's invention. Rumford married the widow of the famous chemist, Antoine Lavoisier, who'd been among the thousands who died on guillotines. But a few years before his marriage, Rumford wrote, I made the acquaintance of Monsieur Guillotin, the contriver of the two famous guillotines. He is a physician and a very mild, polite, humane man. This may all seem quite ghoulish, but the point is clear enough. It is that we technologists are obliged to think twice when we're given the chance to sanitize death. When all is said and done, little separates gentle Dr. Guillotin's beheading machine from, say, the development of the neutron bomb. I'm John Leinhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the Friends of KUHF. Today we look for the first clocks. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. When was the mechanical clock invented? It's a hard question, not because people wrote too little about early clocks, but because they wrote the wrong things. The problem is that the mechanical clock seemed at first to be a mere improvement on the older water clock, which had been around for well over a thousand years. The existing records ignore working details, so it's hard to tell when the changeover took place. The water clock used a steady, regulated flow of water into a vertical tank, the rising water level in the tank indicated the time of day. That all sounds simple enough, but water clocks were large, ornate structures with a lot of supporting gear work and general fancification. Like the later mechanical clocks, they often told the hours on bells, for example. Mechanical clocks differed by using an escapement mechanism to regulate time. The balance wheel on a watch or the pendulum on a grandfather's clock is an escapement, a mechanism that ticks in a steady rhythm and lets the gears move forward at a steady rate in little equal jumps. The first escapement we know about was described in 1250 A.D. by the French engineer Villard d'Onecourt, but it wasn't used to control a clock. 
Instead, it was used in a cute little gadget that steadily pointed at the sun while it moved through the daytime sky. Monastery records after 1250, for the next hundred years, refer to clock bells to gearing to clock towers, but clock terminology rode right through this changeover. The first clear drawing of a mechanical clock was given us by Jacopo di Dondi and his son in 1364, and they'd probably been building them for at least 20 years by then. We can't be sure, but the first mechanical clock was probably made in the late 1200s. It's strange that such an earth-shattering change could be that invisible. Water clock inaccuracies had bottomed out at around 15 minutes a day, and that's about as well as the first mechanical clocks did. But now, suddenly, engineers began to cut that error in half every 30 years, right up into the 20th century. It wasn't long before mechanical clocks swept the imagination of the Western world and led to new standards of precision, first in instruments and ultimately in thought itself. The most important technology of an age might not be the most obvious one. Great changes sometimes come in on little cat feet, and that's what the mechanical clock did in the 13th century. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's tell the remarkable tale of Évariste Galois. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Évariste Galois was the father of modern algebra. He was born in France in 1811, and he died of gunshot wounds 20 years and 7 months later, still a minor when his brief turbulent life ended. He began his career in mathematics by failing the entry exam for the École Polytechnique twice because his answers were so odd. He was accepted into the École Normale, only to be expelled when he attacked the director in a letter to the papers. A few months later, he was arrested for making a threatening speech against the king. He was acquitted, but then tossed right back into jail when he illegally wore a uniform and carried weapons. He spent the next eight months writing mathematics. But then, as soon as he got out, he was devastated by an unhappy love affair. I guess it'd be fair to say he was a typical bright young teenager. For some murky reason, maybe underhanded police work, he was challenged to a duel on May 30th, 1832. A duel he couldn't win, but which he couldn't dodge either. By then, his talents as a mathematician were known. He'd published some material, and luminaries like Gauss, Jacobi, and Cauchy knew of him. On May 29th, he wrote and wrote. That day and night, he wrote a letter that included most of the hundred or so pages of mathematics he produced during his entire short life. He set down what proved to be the very foundations of modern algebra and group theory. Some of the theorems he wrote that night weren't proved for a century. He faced death with a cool desperation, reaching down inside himself and getting at truths we do not know how he found. His fright and arrogance were mixed. The letter was peppered with asides. On the one hand, he wrote, I do not say to anyone that I owe to his counsel or encouragement what is good in this work. But on the other hand, he penned in the margins, I have no time. When poet Carol Drake read his story, she wrote, Until the sun I have no time. But the flash of thought is like the sun, sudden, absolute. Watch at the desk, through the window raised on the flawless dark, the hand that trembles in the light, lucid, sudden. Until the sun, I have no time. I cry to you, I have no time. Watch. This light is like the sun, illumining grass, seacoast, this death. I have no time. Be thou my time. The next morning, Galois was shot. Two days later, dead, but he'd done more for his world in one night than most of us will do in a lifetime, because he knew he could find something in that moment that he had to look inside himself. 
I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's talk about germs. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. That great master of American doggerel, Ogden Nash, once wrote, A mighty creature is the germ, though smaller than the pachyderm. His strange delight he often pleases by giving people strange diseases. Our knowledge of microbes is just over 300 years old. They were first observed in the late 17th century by the Dutch lens maker Anton von Leuwenhoek. He found that these tiny animalcules, as he called them, swam in any body of water. But what about relating these small beasts to disease? 150 years later, disease was rampant in London. Half of the newborn babies died, and the death rate was far higher among the poor than among the wealthy. Two things were also clear by then. One is that London's drinking waters were, by and large, simply loaded with microorganisms. The other is that filth, particularly raw sewage, was to be found everywhere in poor areas. It's obvious enough to us that germs were causing the diseases. But germs, after all, swam in the waters drunk both by the well and the sick. What was obvious was that bad smells were found in unhealthy neighborhoods. It seemed clear that stench, or miasma as it was called, caused disease, not the water. It was the stink that people felt they had to get rid of. Then in 1849 and 53, London suffered terrible epidemics of cholera. In 1853, a physician named John Snow started looking at statistics. He found a high incidence of cholera among people who'd been drawing water from a source called the Broad Street Well. Then he found that the cesspool of a tenement occupied by a cholera patient leaked into the Broad Street Well. Snow's report soon caused people to see that cholera was not caused by noxious gases, but by what is now called fecalized water. He put people on the track of the real agent of the disease. In 1857, Pasteur connected disease to bacteria, and in 1865, Joseph Lister found that he could kill disease-carrying bacteria during surgery by spraying a carbolic acid solution. Finally, in 1882, 29 years after Snow pinpointed the Broad Street well, the German physician, Robert Koch, showed us how to make a disease-specific vaccine. Koch, who'd found the bacterium that caused anthrax, figured out how to make a vaccine to kill it. Scientific discovery is like that. It can take decades for people to overturn their old thinking. The leap from unhealthy vapors to bacteria was still a hard leap to make, even once the Broad Street well showed that a leap had to be made. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we ask if we'll ever ride in a dirigible. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Four government agencies met in 1975, NASA, the FAA, the Navy, and the Department of Transportation. They gathered in a workshop to reassess lighter-than-air flight. This meeting took place 39 years after the German Zeppelin Hindenburg burned at Lakehurst, New Jersey, and virtually put an end to commercial airships. The Hindenburg disaster branded flammable hydrogen as unsafe for buoying these great whales up in the sky. It had to be replaced with helium. But on the eve of World War II, we controlled the world's supply of helium. When Germany couldn't get helium, dirigibles went out of business. 
The 1975 workshop didn't just ask whether these gentle monsters should be made to fly again. It also brought to light a stunning array of extensions of the old technology. Things like hybrid airships with airfoil-shaped bodies to add lift in flight, small blimps for urban transport, airships with different shapes, blimps to move large heavy items that won't fit in airplanes, airships for all payloads, ranges, and speeds. The workshop concluded that the potential for airships is enormous, but that the question of economic feasibility won't be answered in a paper study. Someone, they said, must bite the bullet and make a commercial venture to answer the question. Thirteen years have passed, and we see few commercial blimps or dirigibles in the sky. Perhaps American industry has failed to respond to the challenge and take the risk, but perhaps not. The technology is, in fact, returning. The lumber industry has tried using load-carrying blimps to move large logs out of remote places. The Navy, which gave up airships 25 years ago, recently let contracts for large surveillance blimps. And we find a new interest in developing commercial sightseeing blimps. Whether we'll ever have the chance to ride a stately zeppelin across the Atlantic, dining in palatial elegance is not clear. One problem with airships is that their slow speed make schedules terribly vulnerable to changing winds. The dirigible wrote a strange chapter in the history of technology. It's a beautiful machine that's come and gone, but may yet return. That sort of thing doesn't often happen, but lighter-than-air flight suffered a strange detour in its development. The airplane distracted us from its potential, but I think we'll see it again. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's look at alchemy. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. When we think of alchemy, we think of magicians trying to change lead into gold. Yet alchemy was actually the study of chemistry from the 3rd century BC all the way through the next 2,000 years. The word probably comes from the Greek chimia, which meant to transmute or change matter. And that's what alchemy, like chemistry itself, has always been concerned with. Alchemy originated when Aristotle took up the older idea that all matter combined the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. He guessed that these elements could be changed, transmuted by the action of heat and cold, or dampness and dryness. Aristotle's ideas were first developed by the Greeks after him, and then by Arab scientists. From time to time, alchemy mired itself in metaphysical razzle-dazzle. The practical Romans had no taste for it at all. So as civilization spread north into Europe, alchemy all but vanished until the 13th and 14th centuries when scholars began to reread the old Greek and Arabic texts. Of course, alchemy promised great wealth to anyone who figured out how to transmute other metals into gold. It might seem a waste that so many alchemists devoted their lives to that, but the spin-off was enormous. By trying to understand transmutation, they learned about practical metallurgy, about extracting metals from ores, and about chemical reaction. Their results were reported in terms alien to our ears, but the late medieval chemists were surprisingly able metallurgists. Late 17th century chemists saw matter as made up of three elements, or earths as they were called. Vitreous earth gave solidity to matter, fluid earth gave it liquidity, and fatty earth, which was later called phlogiston, gave it combustibility. These were the old Aristotelian elements of earth, water, and fire, without air. Air was thought to be inert and not part of other materials. All the while, a more and more analytical science was being built on these ideas. The alchemical view of matter didn't give way to an atomic theory until less than 200 years ago. And then it didn't give way completely. When people realized that heat wasn't a part of matter, they replaced phlogiston with caloric, Caloric was another Aristotelian substance that occupied all matter and flowed from hot bodies to cold ones. 
even after the atomic theory of matter replaced the various Earths, caloric was still being used to describe heat when my grandfather was a little boy. So before we write alchemy off as voodoo magic, we'd better ask what our own chemistry will look like in the 22nd century. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, a note on Napoleon and ironworks. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Two years before he took over France, Napoleon Bonaparte was only 28 and head of the French army. That year, 1797, he was made a member of the scientific division of the Institute of France. That's right, Napoleon was honored for contributions to science. And for good reason. The young Napoleon was an important supporter of science and engineering. He'd already done a lot to strengthen the École Polytechnique, the French engineering school. A year later, he made his Egyptian campaign into a scientific mission as much as a military one. It was during this campaign that a French archaeologist discovered the Rosetta Stone. But later, Napoleon's support for the applied sciences got mixed up with a fixation on architectural monuments. In 1804, the same year as he was made emperor, he wrote, Men are only as large as the monuments they leave. Historian Francis Steiner tells us that Napoleon dreamt of building monuments from his military spoils, of melting cannon into heroic structures in iron to celebrate battles won, he was still interested in engineering, but that interest had turned to his own glory. But there was a problem with working in iron. England had mastered ironwork, but France lagged far behind. English iron was expensive, and the quality of French iron was poor. France was still smelting iron with charcoal instead of coke, and her engineers hadn't learned to build with iron. Napoleon's new breed of French engineers was eager and surprisingly well prepared to take up the challenge, but French architects were consummate artists in granite. They wanted nothing to do with iron. During Napoleon's reign as emperor, some major works were done in iron. A number of bridges were built with varying success. Once they got the hang of it, the French built a 106-foot arch over the Seine River and named it after the Battle of Austerlitz. The toughest job was building a 120-foot iron dome over a circular grain exchange. It was finished just two years before Waterloo, at seven times the original cost estimate. France didn't by any means catch up with England during Napoleon's reign. She had too far to go. France eventually built the Eiffel Tower and the Statue of Liberty using iron, but that was 70 years after Napoleon. Napoleon did start France on its way to iron construction, but his greatest gift didn't spring from his craving for monuments. History has shown that the younger, more idealistic Napoleon left us a far more important gift in the foundation he helped lay for education in the applied sciences. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we talk about bicycles and freedom. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The history of the bicycle is curiously tied to that of the horseless carriage. Together they represent the routes taken by the poor and by the wealthy to freedom of motion. The early 1800s saw all kinds of new steam-powered vehicles. At first, steam carriages competed with locomotives, but the railways won that battle largely because they made transportation inexpensive in a way steam carriages couldn't. Still, trains were confining. 
People wanted freedom to travel the roads as they pleased. The new dream of rapid movement had to be individualized. If the answer was not to be the steam carriage, then maybe it could be the bicycle. Between 1816 and 1818, Scottish, German, and French makers all came out with primitive bicycles. They all seated a rider between a front and a back wheel with his feet touching the ground so he could propel himself with a walking motion. The odd thing about this form of the bicycle is that it wasn't new. Such bikes are found in Renaissance stained glass, Pompeian frescoes, and even in Egyptian and Babylonian bas-reliefs. But the Scottish maker, Macmillan, added a feature to his hobby horse, as he called it, around 1839. He added a pedal-operated crank to drive the back wheel, like the pedal-operated chain drive on your bike. Oddly enough, the idea didn't catch on then, and later bikes used a pedal attached to the front wheel, like the tricycles we rode as children. The front wheel pedal led to larger and larger front wheels. The bigger the wheel, the further the bike would move on each turn of the pedal. This led to the dangerously unstable bicycle you've seen in Courier and Ives prints, the one with the huge front wheel and the tiny back one. In its developed form, it was called the ordinary bicycle, but it was nicknamed Penny Farthing because its wheels looked like large and small coins. The ordinary was so tricky that it finally gave way to the so-called safety bicycle, the modern bike with two equal wheels, the back one driven by a chain and sprocket. The safety bike was a lot like Macmillan's hobby horse design 46 years earlier. It went into production in 1885 and soon not only replaced the ordinary, but remained the basic bike design ever after. So the modern bike entered the 20th century along with the new gasoline automobiles. It freed those people who couldn't afford cars. Now they too could go where they pleased. And oh, the sense of freedom I felt as a boy when I got my first bike. It let me fly like the wind and go where I wanted. It was a wonderful thing. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we offer Anne Boleyn an automobile. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. In 1533, a wool trader named John Marmon, who'd been operating in northern France, was languishing in prison for failing to pay a debt. That year, he petitioned Henry VIII to release him. The English historian James Alsop tells us that the practice in those days was to offer a bribe along with such a request, and he quotes these words from Marmon's petition. In recompense for your goodness towards me, I will give unto your mastership a wagon, which will be a gift very meet for the Queen's grace. In the same wagon may sit two persons with ease, and it is to go without horse or other cattle. I suppose it costs twenty angel nobles in Flanders. In doing this, you shall do a great charitable deed and bind me to pray for you, my life enduring. What a frustrating little item to find in the dusty records of 450 years ago. This unhappy fellow wanting to get out of jail is offering Henry VIII a horseless carriage for his new queen, Anne Boleyn, to ride in. It's frustrating to us because we know of no horseless carriage that had yet been invented in 1533 and because we don't know how to find out more about the circumstances of this strange offer. What is doubly odd is that the wagon, as Marmon called it, apparently already existed, and the value he put upon it made it worth more than a conventional horse-drawn wagon. More than likely, it was something he picked up in trade in the Netherlands, a curiosity he'd set aside for the rainy day that had now come into his life. If we look closely at his words, they exclude animal power, but that leaves alternatives. The steam engine lay 200 years in the future. Maybe human pedal power fit the terms of his description, although pedaled vehicles didn't appear until 300 years later. I wonder if it might not have been sail or spring-driven. 
We have no record that Marmon's petition was accepted, certainly no record that Anne Boleyn ever rode this vehicle. The one thing this strange little byroad in English history does is to remind us that the dream of the horseless carriage was alive and well even that long ago. Whatever Marmon's wagon really was, it reflects the dream that ultimately gave us the automobile. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's talk about women in engineering. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The history of technology sometimes seems so male-dominated. We're finding that women have done much more than we'd realized in other fields, but that's less true in engineering. Nine years ago, historian Ruth Cowan blamed the situation on the way women are socialized. She said, while we socialize our men to aspire to feats of mastery, we socialize our women to aspire to feats of submission. Men are meant to conquer nature. Women are meant to commune with it. Boys play with blocks. Girls play with dolls. Women who wish to become engineers have to suppress some deeply ingrained notions about their own sexual identity. No doubt that's been true, but it's a pattern that's been changing since the mid-19th century. Historian Carol Purcell responded by taking stock of American women inventors. He began with a mill designed in 1715 by Sibylla Masters for cleaning and curing corn. But he notes that she had to patent the device in her husband's name. Scientific American magazine took up the cause of women in 1861 when it plonkingly suggested that women do not exercise their ingenuity as much as they ought. A year later, it reported that the magazine took out several patents each year on behalf of women who wrote letters suggesting new ideas. You see the heavy hand of social attitudes behind both these illustrations. Still, progress was being made. In 1888, the Patent Office listed all women inventors since 1790. They showed only 52 before 1860, and nearly 3,000 between 1860 and 1888. Change was indeed afoot, but not enough. When the transactions of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers talked about using women in factories in 1917, it still used very patronizing language. Listen to this. We have found women, under proper conditions and with proper training, almost, if not quite, the equal of men. They are remarkably quick to learn. And it went on, It has been necessary to more closely supervise the work turned out by women, for few women have any conception of the importance of dimensions. That was seventy years ago. Today, the retiring president of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers is a woman. Women make up 16% of today's engineering students, and they're a significant part of the engineering scene. Technically trained women loom particularly large in our astronaut and spacecraft programs. The problem of social attitudes is still around, of course. Not all parents and high school counselors really understand how good a field engineering can be for women. Still, women have quietly become a very important part of engineering today. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we talk about two ships. One sank, the other didn't. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Both the Titanic and the Great Eastern in their day qualified as the largest ships ever made, and they're two of the best known as well. The Great Eastern, launched in 1858, was almost 700 feet long. The Titanic, launched 53 years later, was almost 900 feet long, and each suffered the same kind of accident soon after it was put to sea. 
Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who designed the Great Eastern, was the greatest artist ever to work in iron. He was remarkably thorough, and the Great Eastern reflected that care. It was to be a passenger liner, and no cost was spared in making it safe. It had a double hull. It was honeycombed with bulkheads that created almost 50 watertight compartments. The Great Eastern was actually over-designed and inefficient, but it still provided transatlantic service for two years. Then, in 1862, it struck an uncharted rock in Long Island Sound and tore an 83-foot-long, 9-foot-wide gash in its hull. The inner hull held, and it safely steamed on into New York Harbor. The Titanic was another matter. Transatlantic service had become a big, lucrative business. Bit by bit, safety standards yielded to commercial pressures. The Titanic's hull boasted a double bottom, but it had only a single wall on the sides. It boasted 15 sections that could be sealed off at the throw of a switch, but its bulkheads were riddled with access doors to improve luxury service. It didn't have enough lifeboats, but the luxurious beauty of the ship was seductive. Why was it thought so safe? Historian Walter Lord says the appearance of safety was mistaken for safety itself. When the Titanic gently grazed a North Atlantic iceberg in 1912, it suffered nothing like the continuous gash in the side of the Great Eastern. Rather, its plates appear to have been randomly punctured and sprung over a 250-foot length. But that was enough to put it under water within two hours and 40 minutes. We might lay part of the blame for the Titanic accident on the success of the Great Eastern. By 1912, past successes had bred a very relaxed attitude toward safety. Maybe a parallel should be drawn in the loss of the space shuttle Challenger. NASA's safety record had been unreasonably good up to that point. We forgot how dangerous rocket launches really are. The Titanic and the Challenger remind us that we engineers have to mix a little fear in with our excitement when we design things. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we look at roads, canals, and railways. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. England's 18th century industrial revolution created a pressing need to haul raw and manufactured goods. The English never had been serious road builders. They'd done little to surpass their old Roman road system in 1500 years' time. But they did build a very effective canal system in the latter 1700s. They also developed a railway system, and that catches us by surprise, because the steam locomotive wasn't invented until much later but these were horse-drawn trains. Since roads were so bad, canals became the major means for hauling goods. But some cross-country portaging had to be done between canals, and roads couldn't stand up to a heavy-wheeled vehicle. So the English developed horse-drawn railways for portage. The idea originally came out of the mines where tramways were used to move coal and ore. When the steam locomotive was finally invented, the technology of building railways was well developed. Engineers also knew a lot about the loads horses could pull. At a slow walk, a horse could pull almost 30 tons through a canal, but only 7 tons on a railway. As he sped up to a trot, water resistance became so great that he could pull almost nothing. But on a railway, he could pull just as much trotting as walking. That meant the same horse could move more goods on a canal but when speed was needed, he did much better on a railway. Trevithick built the first steam locomotive in 1804, and railway speeds increased rapidly from then on. Water resistance made canals quite useless at the speed of a train. From the early 19th century until the modern automobile, railways therefore dominated English transportation. The land locomotive, the early steam car, made a valiant try during those years, but it was easier to develop a rail system than a road system that could support such heavy vehicles. 
So many factors were at play in that brief 80-year period. Who could have guessed the outcome in 1760 when roads, rails, and canals began to compete for supremacy? That's a sobering question as we watch the competition among the systems that make up today's technologies. Can any of us guess what form our transportation will take in another 80 years, or our military defense systems, or our computer systems? I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we build a secret subway. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The first American subway system was built under the oddest circumstances. The year was 1868, only five years after a small experimental subway line was first tried out in London. What's even more remarkable is that it was 30 years before regular subway service was finally established in America. In 1868, Alfred Ely Beach, then the publisher of Scientific American magazine, petitioned the city of New York for something called a postal dispatch charter. That was actually just a ruse, a smokescreen. It was a way to get legal authorization to build a subway system without letting the city of New York know what he was doing. Beach's plan was to start a subway line with a small 300-foot demonstration run under Broadway. He wanted to keep it a secret from the corrupt Tammany Hall boss, Tweed, because he knew Tammany Hall would extort extra money before they let him dig. The subway itself sparkled with Beach's ingenuity. He designed his own hydraulically driven shield for workers digging the nine-foot diameter hole. The English later adopted this design for their own excavations. He put his son in charge of digging the tunnel in secret at night. The finished tunnel had a single pneumatically driven car that shuttled people between two sumptuous stations with paintings, frescoes, and fine Victorian furniture. It cost Beach $350,000. When the subway opened two years later, Boss Tweed was enraged. He managed to close it down within a year. Three years later, Tweed was indicted and Beach's charter to develop a full subway was reinstated. But by then, a stock market collapse put Beach out of business for good. The subway was sealed up and forgotten. It was only discovered in 1912 during excavations for an extension of the Broadway-Manhattan Transit Line, the BMT. That must have been like stumbling across King Tut's tomb. All that sealed up elegance rediscovered after 40 years. Today, Beach's tube is part of the BMT line. Of course, Beach's legacy is much more than a fragment of the BMT tunnel. He was a pioneer in the art of tunneling. He helped establish the century and a half old Scientific American magazine. But primarily, he was a dreamer ahead of his time and no great engine of our ingenuity has ever been established until dreamers like Beach have pointed our way to it. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we meet the oldest airplane designer. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The airplane that finally brought down von Richthofen, the Red Baron, was an English biplane called the Sopwith Camel. The Camel was a maneuverable little airplane, and my father, who flew them in France, told me they were tricky to fly, but with a good pilot they were deadly in combat. In 1916, the Germans controlled the air over the Western Front. The Sopwith Camel changed all that in 1917. 
It was called the camel because someone thought the pilot's windscreen and headrest looked like a camel's hump on the fuselage, and Thomas Sopwith manufactured them. Sopwith was 15 when the Wright brothers flew. He learned how to fly in 1910 when he was 22. By then he'd raced automobiles and speedboats, and he'd done daredevil ballooning. In no time he won flying prizes, and he used the prize money to start making airplanes. He was now 24, and World War I was brewing. His first planes were used early in the war, and when the Sopwith Camel gave the air back to the Allies in July 1917, Sopwith was still under 30. He stayed with airplane manufacturing after the war. In 1935, he was made chairman of the Hawker Sidley Group, and there he did a most remarkable thing. In 1936, he decided to produce a thousand Hawker Hurricanes on his own, without a government contract. War was brewing again, and if the British government wasn't ready, he at least was. Without his Hawker Hurricanes, England would have been laid bare against the Nazi bombers during the Battle of Britain. But that was far from the last of Sopwith. After World War II, he was involved in developing the Hawker Harrier, the first jet airplane that could take off and land vertically. You heard a lot about it during the recent Falklands War. Sopwith finally celebrated his 100th birthday on January 18, 1988. The RAF sent flights of his own airplanes past his home near London. What a history lesson that was, from early flying machines to modern jets, a parade that spelled out the whole history of powered flight in the life of this remarkable man with his uncanny ability to read the future. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's look for the first helicopter. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. It's frustrating to try to find the first helicopter. Leonardo da Vinci had the idea of pulling himself into the air with a vertically mounted propeller, and the idea was seductively simple. But for the next four and a half centuries, one inventor after another ran into terrible problems when he actually tried to do it. There are three kinds of heavier-than-air flight. An airplane lifts off the ground when its propeller or jet pulls a lifting wing through the air. An autogyro works like that. A propeller pulls it forward, but instead of a wing, it has another large propeller on top. The second propeller is freewheeling. It's not powered. It just whirls in the wind and lifts the plane up. But a helicopter propeller is powered, and it lifts the machine directly upward. It combines both power and lift in the same propeller. After da Vinci, the idea of the helicopter resurfaced in France in 1784 in the form of a working model driven by a bowstring. About the same time, ballooning also got its start in France. During the 19th century, all kinds of ingenious helicopter models were built throughout Europe. In 1877, for example, Enrico Forlanini flew a large steam-powered model to a height of over 40 feet in Milan. But it wasn't until 1907 that the Frenchman, Paul Cornu, hovered just off the ground for 20 seconds in a strange 32-bladed helicopter. Cornu, like the Wright brothers four years earlier, was a bicycle maker. Several other early helicopters were made, but they were all underpowered and hard to control. When the more manageable autogyro was developed in the 20s, helicopters were abandoned. In 1936, the Germans built a successful hybrid helicopter autogyro whose engine drove both lifting and pulling propellers. Igor Sikorsky built the first real helicopter in the United States in 1939. He'd tried to build one in Russia 30 years before, but failed. Now, after designing airplanes for 30 years and with vastly improved technology, he succeeded. 
Then the Germans dropped the forward propeller on their model, making it into a pure helicopter. The Russians soon copied the Germans, and we all had military helicopters during World War II. The helicopter was in people's minds long before the airplane, but it was a hard dream to fulfill. Its history is littered with half-successes. The very simplicity of combining power and lift in one big propeller leads to awful design problems. Da Vinci was drawn in by its simplicity 500 years ago. He couldn't see how hard it would be to control motion with a single propeller. This complexity, masking as simplicity, kept right on teasing and misleading designers until 1939. I'm John Leinhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's ask who discovered oxygen. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. In the middle 18th century, people thought air was inert, that it didn't take part in combustion. We know that the oxygen in air reacts with other materials when they burn, but 18th century chemists thought burning materials were simply releasing an invisible fluid called phlogiston, which caused heating. No one supposed burning had anything to do with the air itself. They didn't know the culprit was oxygen, which makes up one-fifth of air. Oxygen was finally pinned down as a separate element by three people in the 1770s. An English cleric named Priestley, the French chemist Lavoisier, and a Swedish pharmacist named Scheele. Priestley isolated oxygen in 1774, but he thought he had laughing gas. A year later, he decided he'd actually taken the phlogiston out of air. At the same time, Lavoisier, who knew about Priestley's work, also isolated oxygen. He took it to be very pure air. Two years later, Lavoisier realized that he'd actually separated a component of air, but he thought it only came into existence when the air was heated. Meanwhile, the Swede, Scheele, had been working quietly. He published a book called Air and Fire just after Lavoisier's final word on the matter. In it, he identified oxygen as a separate part of air based on work he'd done before either Priestley or Lavoisier. Historian Thomas Kuhn uses this muddle to explain a problem that bedevils scientific discovery. Squabbles over credit cloud the real nature of discoveries. Should we credit Priestley, who isolated oxygen and then went to his death thinking it was something else? Should we credit Lavoisier, who saw it was part of air but didn't understand its nature? And what about Scheele, who published his work after that part of the game was over? The fact is, Oxygen couldn't really be understood until scientists changed their whole view of matter. Priestley started a scientific revolution that wouldn't be finished until John Dalton built oxygen into the atomic theory of matter 30 years later. The idea that burning meant new combinations of atoms was too great a leap for any one person to make. The pieces of the puzzle added up and added up until suddenly an unexpected new picture came clear. Oxygen wasn't just discovered. Oxygen, as we understand it today, couldn't have been discovered in 1770. Instead, a whole new science had to be forged to accommodate it. Priestley, Lavoisier, Scheele, Dalton, each added new insights that finally forced a major scientific revolution. I'm John Leinhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we meet the father and son who built the Brooklyn Bridge. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them.
For me, the story of John Roebling begins in Kentucky near where I used to live. On Sunday afternoons, we'd take the kids to see the old high bridge over the Kentucky River. Well over a hundred years old and long since out of service, it was a glorious spiderweb of steel that seemed very much a part of the quiet, hilly isolation around it. Roebling had started building it in 1853, but his funds ran out and someone else finished it. Roebling was born in Prussia in 1806. He studied engineering in Berlin where the philosopher Hegel told him that America was a land of hope for all who are wearied of the historic armory of old Europe. Roebling liked the sound of that, and he moved here in 1831. First he worked on canal equipment. That led him to invent wire cable to replace the hemp used for tow ropes. Small suspension bridges were gaining in popularity, and Roebling saw that his cables could be used to transform them into something very grand. His first contract was to bridge the Monongahela River with an eight-span, 1,500-foot-long bridge. It was finished in 1846. But the bridge that really established Roebling was a suspension bridge over Niagara Falls, finished in 1855. He followed this with the Cincinnati Bridge over the Ohio River. It was a single span more than a thousand feet long that he finished in 1866, and it's still in use today. While the Cincinnati Bridge was just getting underway, Roebling embarked on the greatest feat, a single span suspension bridge 1,600 feet long from Manhattan to Brooklyn. He was hotly opposed by ferryboat operators who stood to lose money and by citizens who thought it couldn't be done. He had backing by 1869, but then, while he was surveying the site, his foot was crushed by loose piling and he soon died of tetanus. His son, Washington, took up the work, and a terrible task it was, plagued by accidents, deaths, and the paralyzing caisson disease. Caisson disease was caused by the pressure variations in the huge caisson piers in the East River. In 1876, it caught up with Washington Roebling. No longer able to walk or even to talk, he kept on supervising the work from the window of a house in Brooklyn Heights. Finally, in 1883, he watched from his window while Grover Cleveland, Chester Arthur, and the citizens of New York opened the longest suspension bridge in the world. It took the vision and drive of two generations of Roeblings to make the Brooklyn Bridge, and it cost them their lives. The bridge, by the way, has a graceful fan-like cross-bracing that we all recognize. That cross-bracing is a pure Roebling touch, and it's what identifies the Brooklyn Bridge as a symbol of New York City today. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we wonder what's real and what's imaginary. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. I recently heard Ken Torrance from Cornell University talk about his work on computer graphics. He created simple scenes, a crib in a room, a jar on a table. He wrote the complicated equations for the reflection and diffusion of light. To illuminate his scenes, he let a computer chew through these terrible equations until it cast light in the same way as a lamp or the sun. You've seen computer pictures in the movies, but his were much better. Colors reflected just the way they should. They mixed perfectly in the shadows. These pictures had the beauty and accuracy of a Dutch master. When Torrance finished, I didn't know whether I was looking at a picture or the thing itself. These weren't just artists' creations. Torrance and his students had written the rules of nature and then let the computer obey those rules. In a sense, they told the computer how to recreate the actual scenes by obeying the rules of nature. Of course, it's not easy to parse reality into the language of computers, yet when we do, the results aren't just stunning, they're disorienting as well. Students of fluid flow struggle to make their computers tell them how fluids move over airfoils, through tubes, past turbine blades. 
As computers lead us through the torturous slow-motion swirls of water and air, we sometimes wonder whether we're seeing reality or the imaginings of a lunatic. The images we create on computers can be more accurate than our imperfect attempts to isolate processes in the laboratory. While the computer's role in our lives expands faster than we know, its users adopt the language of people dealing with real things. They speak of doing numerical experiments when they isolate processes on the machine. They're disarmingly casual about separating computer and laboratory data. And the computer takes a larger and larger role as a partner in human decision-making. We're no longer sure whether we're looking at a picture created by an artist, a camera, or a computer. The computer can make the sound of a concert grand piano that will fool me. As the computer speaks to our senses as well as to our minds, we start having trouble finding the line between realities of the machine and realities outside it. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we say goodbye to lighthouses and cabooses. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Our railways are caught in a funny debate these days. The caboose is a kind of moving observation tower, a way of seeing over and beyond a railway train. Electronic safety systems are making them obsolete, but cabooses are so much a part of the romance of railroading that no one wants to give them up. And that's how it is with lighthouses, too. Lighthouses and cabooses are woven into the romance of the rails and of the sea. Lighthouses are used at night to mark any danger to shipping. Sea crossings, rocks, major landfalls... The distance from the light to the horizon depends on how high the lamp is. So, height is important. A 15-foot light can be seen for four and a half miles. A 120-foot light is visible over 12 miles away, and so forth. That's why the pharos at Alexandria was so big. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world, it held a bonfire 400 feet in the air. And, like it, Lighthouses down through the centuries were usually tall masonry towers mounted on shore, maybe on shoreline cliffs, burning wood or olive oil, and later coal or candles. It was a pretty static technology. Rotating beams weren't invented until 1611. Reflectors weren't added until 1763. The first lens was introduced less than 200 years ago. Lighthouse construction began to move again in 1698, when the English had to warn ships away from the Eddystone Rocks, 14 miles southwest of Plymouth. You've probably heard the old folk song, O oh, me father was the keeper of the Eddystone Light, and he slept with a mermaid one fine night. And from this union there came three, a porpoise and a porgy, and the other was me. Well, building the Eddystone Light was a terrible job. It had to be erected right at sea level, where it was hammered by waves. The first one made of wood lasted five years. The next one made of wood and iron burned down after 47 years. The third, made in 1759 with a new kind of interlocking stone construction, stood. It wasn't replaced until 1881, and that heady stone light is still with us. But now, radar and sonar and electric buoys are putting an end to the lighthouse. We'll have to live in a world without cabooses on trains and without those beautiful storm-beaten minarets to call the weary sailor home. The siren attraction of the lighthouse, like other technologies past and, I suppose, like much technology yet to come, is that good technology is contrived to fulfill human need. That's why it satisfies more than function. It expresses what's inside us. Good technology has symbolic as well as functional power, and that's why we're so loath to say goodbye to it. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work.
This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we meet the man who showed us how to count to infinity. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. When I was in grade school, Time magazine ran an article that snatched my imagination. Someone proposed a new number called the Google, a one followed by a hundred zeros. Later I learned that it wouldn't help very much in counting real objects, because we'd be hard-pressed to find that many real objects in the whole universe, even atoms. But still, we've all wondered where counting ends and infinity begins, and we have good reason for asking about infinity. Every engineering student knows that infinity isn't just the end of numbers. If we ask how real systems behave when velocities or time or force becomes infinite, if we ask about the character of infinity, we get some very unexpected answers. The mathematician Georg Cantor also wondered about infinity. He was born in Russia in 1845 and was taught by a father who wouldn't let him become a violinist and who didn't want him studying mathematics either. But when he was 17, his father died. Cantor went on to finish a doctorate in mathematics in Berlin when he was only 22 years old. His career wasn't long. He burned out before he was 40 and spent the rest of his life in and out of mental illness. But what he did was spectacularly important, and it arose out of an innocent counting question. He began with an idea we find even in Mother Goose. Do you remember one potato, two potato, three potato, four? five potato, six potato, seven potato, more. Counting is like matching one set of things with another, in this case, numbers with potatoes. Cantor asked if counting all the infinite number of points in a line was like counting all the points in a surface. To answer the question, he had to invent something called transfinite numbers, numbers that go beyond infinity. And to do that, he had to invent set theory. And set theory has become a basic building block of modern mathematics. Cantor fell into an odyssey of the mind, a journey through a strange land. He had to overcome the resistance of his father, of the great mathematicians of the day, and even of his own doubts. When he was 33, he wrote, The essence of mathematics is freedom. To do what he did, he had to value freedom very highly, freedom coupled with iron discipline. Freedom expressed through the driving curiosity of a bright child. Freedom to pursue innocent fascination until it finally touched the world we all live in. Cantor lived his troubled life until 1918, and that was long enough for him to finally see set theory accepted and himself vindicated for his soul-scarring voyage of the mind. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we watch an amateur build ships. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Author James Childs notes that the United States built only two freighters between 1922 and 1937. Our merchant shipbuilding was nearly dead on the eve of World War II and the Axis nations were torpedoing Allied ships off the surface of the ocean. England in particular needed ships, and they needed them right away. To make matters worse, Allied shipbuilders were hopelessly preoccupied with warships. Somebody would have to start making freighters from scratch. In 1940, the English were desperate enough to turn to an American group of heavy construction companies led by Henry Kaiser, who'd never built any sort of a ship. The English carried with them the plans for a kind of generic freighter, functional, not fancy. Kaiser had neither workers nor shipyards with which to make these ships, but he turned his lack of preparation to remarkable advantage. 
Did it take years to train a well-rounded shipbuilder? Fine. He rearranged work so he didn't need well-rounded people. He broke shipbuilding into components and prefabrication so each worker had only to learn a small piece of the job. Did he need heavy equipment to cut metal plate? No matter. He simply used oxacetylene torches for the first time. In one case, he cut the time it took to train novices to tightrope across steel structures by hiring ballet dancers as fitters. Kaiser redefined shipbuilding to match his resources. For the first time, he did it with assembly line techniques, interchangeable parts on a gigantic scale. His product, the Liberty Ship, was 440 feet long, and it carried 9,000 tons of cargo. The first one came off the ways just after Pearl Harbor. During 1942, ships were launched within less than a month, then in just 10 days, and finally, one was launched after just four days' time. Kaiser ate steel so rapidly that he had to set up his own mill. Behind all the schoolboy excitement lay a darker side. We produced 11 million tons of shipping in 1942, but submarines sank 12 million tons. In 1943, we raised that to 20 million tons of shipping, and we prevailed. The Liberty ship saved us. Kaiser's genius lay in his freedom of mind. By holding shipbuilding up to the clear light of amateur scrutiny, he brought it into the 20th century. But what he did was rooted in a powerful common purpose, and that purpose ended with the war. First Japan, and now Korea, have claimed Kaiser's legacy and built on his methods and now they dominate world shipbuilding. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we cut with Occam's razor. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The old shaker tune, "'Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where you ought to be," should be the first chapter in any book on engineering design. It was a lesson I fell into when the Army got me two years after I finished college. They put me in the Signal Corps engineering labs designing research equipment. There I met a fine designer named Jules Soled, a guy who could clearly teach me things. So I said to him, teach me and I'll work for you. And teach me he did, many things, things I hadn't learned in school. But his first and last lesson was always this, do a first design and then attack it. Your first design will be elegant and complicated, but it'll always work better when you get rid of complication. In a really good design, he said, you eventually make the very design itself unnecessary. And this, he told me, is very hard to do because we like complication. An early proponent of this idea was William of Ockham, a 14th century scholastic. He told us we should make no more assumptions than we really needed to explain anything that the simple explanation is best. We call this idea Occam's razor because it helps us cut away the junk in our thinking. Look at the safety razor. For years, designers fought with the problem of loading, mounting, and unloading a blade in a holder. Some of you might remember Schick's push-pull, click-click ad for its mechanism. Keeping the action workable and the blade solidly in place was a big problem. Then some bright person applied Occam's razor to the razor mounting problem. He realized you could simply mold the blade right into the plastic packaging. Now, who buys replaceable razor blades? Instead, we set the blades, very solidly and with great precision, right into a cheap throwaway piece of plastic. We've designed blade holding mechanisms right out of existence. That sort of thing takes nerve as well as imagination. We're so tempted to look smart by mastering not simplicity, but complication. If we go back to our shaker tune, "'Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free," the second line says, "'Tis a gift to come down where you ought to be." Good design exacts a price from our egos. 
but it really is a gift. It really is freedom to find the simplicity in things, to finally reduce an engineering design down to where it ought to be. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's ask whether you'd buy a telephone if you'd never seen one before. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. My father was raised in the little Swiss-American community of Nauvoo, Illinois. He told me about coming home from school one day in the late 1890s to find his mother shouting into a strange box mounted on the wall. It was the first time he'd seen a telephone. I've often wondered why she bought it, what she'd seen in this strange new gadget. Alexander Graham Bell patented the telephone in 1876. By 1880, one American in 10,000 had a phone, and when my father came home that day, the number was still only about one in 70. In its first quarter century, the telephone did not by any means sweep the country. Historian Claude Fisher recently went back through old telephone advertisements to see what had been involved in making this novelty into what it is today. The telephone was first seen as a replacement for the telegraph. Advertisers pointed out that telephones were better for transmitting news, ordering groceries, and sending urgent messages. Brevity had been awfully important in using the telegraph, and that attitude was carried over to the telephone. Gossip and chit-chat were discouraged. Telephone companies complained about frivolous use of telephones and told their users to be businesslike. Their machines were, after all, important. Not until the 1920s did the telephone companies catch on to what people really wanted from this wonderful machine. They wanted to be drawn into a kind of living tether with one another. The Bell Company started telling long-distance customers, Your voice is you. In the 1930s, AT&T first suggested that we reach out and touch someone. And today, even in business, that's how we use telephones. Telephones unite our scattered families and keep friendships alive. Oddly enough, Alexander Graham Bell himself predicted the social use of the telephone, but its early makers and users didn't see it that way. It used to bother me that up to the day he died, my father never could relax and chat with me on a long-distance telephone call. It took the next generation to see that the inherent use of the telephone was social. Our tools teach us. They drive our minds and evolve their own roles in our lives. Some do it more quickly than others. It took a long time for the telephone to explain itself to us. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we ask what's inside a black box. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The word black box hasn't been in our vocabulary very long. It first meant a closed array of electronic gear, but it's come to mean any function that's hidden from sight. In fact, it's practically turned into a metaphor for a retreat from understanding how things function. When we call the flight recorder of an airliner a black box, we acknowledge that it's only to be opened under the most dire circumstances. When I was a kid, we stocked radio tubes on the shelf like light bulbs. When one burned out, we replaced it. Today's radios have transistors in them. If one fails, we replace the radio itself. Radios are black boxes. I have almost no idea what's in mine. Our calculators, 
Car transmissions and clocks have all become black boxes. Even their labels tell us that they can only be opened by factory representatives. How do you do with questions like, how often does a spark plug fire as an automobile engine turns over? What's a universal joint? Or what does a carburetor do? You aren't likely to know these things today because cars themselves have become black boxes. Once upon a time, a car owner could look right into the transmission of his Model T Ford. More than that, he had to know how to fix it if he wanted it to keep running. The automobile used to be a marvelous teacher of applied mechanics. The radio taught a whole generation about electronic circuitry. I got my grounding in internal combustion, aerodynamics, and electric circuitry by building model airplanes. That was a real ground-up activity in 1943. Of course, young people today know all sorts of things their parents didn't at the same age. But there's a price. We handled very sophisticated systems, but were not trained to look inside the black boxes that surround us. The price is that our knowledge itself becomes black boxed. A person knows about computers, but may understand nothing about cars. John Donne's poetry might remain a black box for a student of 19th century Russian literature. Educating strong and capable engineers means teaching students that the black boxes around them aren't Pandora's boxes. They can be opened. We want them to know that what one fool can do, another fool can also do that they're smart enough to open anyone else's black box, that invention means working inside black boxes. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we ask how an invention is born. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. Let's ask whether inventions fight their way into the world from inside inventors' heads, or are they made in response to worldly needs? Look at the steamboat. It was reinvented dozens of times before Fulton, but it never caught on. When Fitch ran a steamboat line in Philadelphia 20 years before Fulton, he couldn't attract enough passengers to pay for it. Of course, Fulton made a much better boat in 1807, but what's more important is that by then, there was a public demand for the steamboat. Compare that with the invention of man-made superconductors. In 1911, mercury was found to have no measurable electric resistance below about 4 degrees Kelvin. During the next 75 years, scientists found natural superconductors, all the way up to 23 degrees Kelvin. Of course, this wasn't invention, it was just scientific reporting. But the practical promise of superconductivity is so great. By getting rid of electric resistance, we can work technological feats of near magic. In fact, the U.S. Navy has for some time used superconducting generators in certain ships. It takes a helium cryostat to cool them, but these high-tech generators save far more weight and costs than the cryostats add. A few years ago, scientists began to see that it might be possible to invent superconductors that would work at higher temperatures, above the boiling point of inexpensive nitrogen coolant, maybe even at room temperature. The break came in 1986 when two Swiss scientists, Müller and Bednorz, discovered a superconducting oxide. Then Paul Chu at the University of Houston rapidly created oxides that were superconducting at twice the temperature of any natural material. Pretty soon, he went well beyond the boiling point of nitrogen. Suddenly, the dream of practical superconductors could be realized with man-made materials. It could be done by invention. And the race was on. The public didn't have to be convinced about the value of this invention. Electrical industries went to war over it. And the race to make practical superconducting systems has spawned remarkable tales of determination on the one hand and intrigue and espionage on the other. So, what is the stimulus for invention? Well, 
Fulton studied water transportation for years before his sudden success, and Paul Chu actually began his search for man-made superconductors back in the 1970s, when the task still seemed hopeless. It's nice when the public welcomes your ideas, but it's the human mind and not mere necessity that mothers invention. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the engines of our ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, we talk about streamlining. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The watchword of the 1930s was modern. If I knew one thing as a child, it was that I lived in the modern world. It was a world where the vertical lines of Art Deco were giving way to the horizontal streamlined form. Everything in the 30s, 40s, and 50s was streamlined. The Douglas DC-3 had brought streamlining to passenger airplanes. The Chrysler Airflow and the Lincoln Zephyr brought it to the automobile. Even my first bike was streamlined. Early in the 20th century, the great German experts in fluid flow had shown us how to streamline bodies to reduce wind resistance. It certainly served this function when things moved fast, but my bicycle hardly qualified, nor did the streamlined micro-chef kitchen stove that came out in 1930. Bathrooms were streamlined. Tractors were streamlined. Streamlining was a metaphor for the brave new world we all lived in. A confusion of design schools competed with each other in the early 30s. The German Bauhaus school had been scattered by the Nazis. Art Deco was dying. Neither the classic colonials nor Corbusier and the international school could gain ascendancy. Then streamlining came out of this gaggle, propelled by American industry and making its simple appeal to the child in all of us. It certainly appealed to the child I was then. In reality, Streamlining was a sales gimmick, something to distract us from the tawdry realities of the Depression. It told us to buy things. It told us we could all go fast. It was hardly one of the great humanist schools of design. The Nazis and Bolsheviks used streamlining as a propaganda tool. American industry used it to make us into consumers. It fairly smelled of technocracy. It lasted till the 1950s when, at last, we were all offended by its dying excesses, the enormous tail fins and chromium structures that made the automobile ridiculous by any aesthetic standard. But I loved airplanes as a child, and the functional curved aeroform shape touched something in me. The way the gentle camber of an airfoil gave the invisible wind a handle by which to pluck a 50-ton airplane into the sky. That was truly magical. When I was a child, said St. Paul, I thought as a child. Streamlining was a childish symbol of our modern world, now put away with other childish things. But I still sneak an occasional look back at that vision of motion, speed, and buoyancy. I'm John Leanhart at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today we meet a medieval mason. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. It's hard to say too much about Gothic cathedrals. They combined incredible size with a delicacy of balance and detail that has to be seen to be believed. The spire of Strasbourg Cathedral, for example, is almost as high as the Washington Monument. Gothic architecture suddenly appeared in the middle of the 12th century. It kept evolving for 250 years, and then it abruptly stopped developing toward the end of the 14th century. 
The people who created this art appear to have been largely uneducated. Only 40% of the master masons could even write their name on a document. They probably knew nothing of formal geometry, and it's unlikely they made any calculations. The medieval cathedral builder learned his empirical art and his empirical science through apprenticeship. The master builder had all kinds of tricks of the trade at his disposal, many of them jealously guarded. These tricks amounted to a vast inventory of knowledge of material selection, personnel management, geometrical proportioning, load distribution, architectural design, and a firm sense of liturgy and Christian tradition. And make no mistake, these men saw no clear boundary between things material and things spiritual. Their art flowed from their right brain. It was visual and spatial. They levitated tons of stone in the air to communicate their praise of God, and when they were finished, they embellished the nooks and crannies and high airies of their buildings with the phantoms of their minds, with cherubs and gargoyles and wild caricatures of one another. They also signed their work boldly and proudly. An inscription 25 feet long on the south transept of Notre Dame Cathedral says, Master Jean de Chelles, commenced this work for the glory of the Mother of Christ on the 2nd of the Ides of February, 1258. So what became of this marvelous art? The best guess is that it died when the master builder became an educated gentleman, when he moved into an office and managed the work of others at a distance. At that point, the kind of hands-on creativity that had driven it so powerfully dried up. Still, this art has recently been recreated here in the United States. The National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. was built with great fidelity to both the style and the working esprit of the medieval art. This huge structure is finally being finished after 82 years of work, and it's breathtaking. If you're ever there, don't miss the chance to see it. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the Friends of KUHF. Today, we look at some really big telescopes. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. The astronomer George Everett Hale was born in 1868, just after the Civil War. As a 24-year-old professor at the University of Chicago, he organized the Yerkes Observatory. There he built the largest telescope ever to use a conventional refractor lens. It was over three feet in diameter, but it was also something of a dinosaur. You see, astronomers gave up conventional lenses in favor of focused mirrors after 1900. But Hale was no dinosaur. By 1904, he'd convinced Andrew Carnegie to give him $150,000 to set up the Mount Wilson Observatory in California. Hale was downright greedy for high resolution and straightaway developed the largest mirror telescope ever built, one five feet in diameter. At first, he joyfully cried, with this we'll record a billion stars. But by 1918, he was back at Carnegie's door for money to support a second mirror, more than eight feet in diameter. He was now only 50 years old, but his health had begun to fail him. He had to retreat from field work in astronomy, but that didn't stop him from planning, writing, and organizing. In 1916, he'd founded the National Research Council, which was very important in setting America's research agenda. But one more telescope was on Hale's agenda, a really big one. Andrew Carnegie was dead by now. But this time, the Rockefellers gave Hale six million dollars for a third mirror, one almost 17 feet in diameter, the mirror that was to become the heart of the Mount Palomar Observatory, also in California. In 1934, the Corning Glass Company tried to make the first rough casting of this 17-foot mirror. They cooked a 50-foot lake of molten glass for six days at 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. When they poured it in the mold, with the press watching, the inside of the mold broke up. Nine months later, they tried again and succeeded. 
It took eight more months to cool it down. Grinding it by hand to within a millionth of an inch took years. The man who'd done this job on the eight-foot mirror had ended in a mental institution. Hale died in 1938, and the Palomar telescope was finally finished ten years later. And, until the Russians made a larger one in 1986, it remained the grandest optical telescope. Compare its 500-foot focal length with the 8-inch focal length of your long-distance zoom lens. It finally took the new radio telescope to improve on its resolution. A person has to be moved by the unmatched vision, nerve, and determination of this man. Just think, over a 56-year period, from the age of 24 until 10 years after his death, George Everett Hale gave us the world's largest telescope not once, but four times. I'm John Leanhard at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. This is the Engines of Our Ingenuity, made possible by the University of Houston and the friends of KUHF. Today, let's look at the hourglass. The University of Houston's College of Engineering presents this series about the machines that make our civilization run and the people whose ingenuity created them. How old is the hourglass? 2,000 years? 4,000 years? Oddly enough, historian R.T. Balmer dates it at about the same time as the first mechanical clocks. It's only about 700 years old. The hourglass had some strong characteristics. On the positive side, it was far simpler and cheaper than the mechanical clock or the earlier water clock. Resetting it after it ran down couldn't be simpler, and it didn't vanish when you used it the way a graduated candle did. Its accuracy wasn't bad either once some problems had been solved. You couldn't just load any old sand into it. You had to find a free-flowing material that was unresponsive to humidity. On the downside, our glasses were pretty short-term timepieces. The very name tells you it's hard to find one that'll run more than an hour. The other big drawback is that they can't be calibrated. Sand moves downward in jerks. The edge of the sand is uneven. If you mark five-minute intervals on the glass, the sand will hit those marks differently each time you turn it. An hourglass really only tells you when an hour is up. Hourglasses found their place in setting off blocks of time, the time between canonical hours in a monastery or between watches on board ship. Of course, they didn't run long enough or accurately enough for marine navigation. They were a poor man's timepiece, a kind of clock for every man. Both the mechanical clock and the hourglass found powerful symbolic roles during the Renaissance. The complex mechanical clock with its rotary gears became a metaphor for the heavenly spheres or the wheel of fortune. But the hourglass, whose sands run out, became a metaphor for that running out of the sands that we all inevitably face. It became and it remains a universal symbol of death. Two technologies, one simple, one complex running side by side, the clock making a continuum of time, the hourglass segmenting it, the clock speaking of timelessness, and the hourglass showing us finality, the clock evoking things celestial, and the hourglass reminding us of base earth. Two technologies, yin and yang. Why was the hourglass so late in coming? I don't know. Maybe it had to wait for its opposite, the mechanical clock, to be invented. I'm John Leanhardt at the University of Houston, where we're interested in the way inventive minds work. <laughs>